Okay. All right. So uh, today's class, we are going to continue talking about conductors and dielectrics. We are going to finish up our discussion on how to calculate resistance of conductors and how to calculate the power dissipation in conductors. And then I'll show you a quick example on COMSOL on how to look at current densities uh, when you have electric uh, currents flowing through uh, a conductive material. So I'll show you how to uh, do a quick simulation of that uh, and to look at current densities. And then we'll start looking at dielectrics. So this is all depending on if we have enough time. If we don't have enough time, we'll get to dielectrics the next day. But let's jump right into it. Um, let's go up here. All right, so quick recap. Last time we talked about, started talking about electric materials. We said that the difference between a dielectric material and a conductive material is that a dielectric material polarizes in the presence of uh, an electric field and there's no current. A conductive material, there's an electric field and current. There's a smaller electric field and a large current. The reason why is because in a conductive material, the charges can move, whereas in a dielectric material, they cannot. So we talked about a conductor in a static field, and then we talked about a conductor and connected to a circuit. We said that in a static field, that when you have charges that are mobile, they move to the outside, they repel each other. Because of this, charges on the surface of a conductor, the charge, um, charges are always distributed equally on the surface of a conductor, and the electric field inside a conductor is generally zero. Give an example of that, uh, and we started talking about current flow. And we said that uh, we define current flow, we define current density, which is the, the units for current density is amps per meter squared. And we said that the total current is the integral, surface integral of the current density over a cross-sectional area. All right. Um, we did some examples of where you have a, a wire with a uniform, non-uniform current density. We talked about drift currents, and we said that drift currents are due to when you place a voltage over uh, a material and it results in an electric field and, and that electric field pushes the charges through the material. Um, the material has a property called mobility, mu, and that uh, property reflects how easily the charges move through the material. The materials also have a charge density, which is the number of charges per unit volume. So conductive materials will have high mobility and high charge density. Okay. We got into electrical conduction of semiconductors. We said in semiconductors, there's two types of carriers, electrons and holes. Okay, so, and we started talking about resistance. So I'd like to revisit this real quick and just have, um, ha have a, uh, um, a discussion from beginning to end on this. So we talked about Ohm's law. We said V equals IR. This is the rule that you learned in your previous uh, circuits courses that you probably learned in physics also. And we defined you know, this I, when we talk about this I in V equals IR, uh, that refers to the drift current that we talked about before in, in that previous slide. Electrons or holes flowing through the material. And the faster they're flowing through material, um, the more current you'll have. Uh, the more charges you have flowing through the material, the more current you're going to have. So the concept of resistance is how difficult it is for the charges to move through the material. If a, if a material has low mobility, meaning like the charges are moving slowly through the material, then it will um, you'll have a higher resistance. Um, also, if the material has a constriction in it, if the you know the width of the wire changes from large to small, that small section of the wire will have more resistance because there's less room for the charges to move through. Okay, but you can think about the volt as a force that's pushing the charges. So the vol volts, um, a voltage creates an electric field. The electric field pushes the charges um, through the wire. And the ohm, you can think about the resistance, think about is resisting the ability for the charge to move. Okay, and in a material, that, that resistance comes from, as you see here, it comes from how much room there is for the charges to move through, so how big the copper wire is. Uh, and it also results in the number of collisions. So certain materials have certain atomic densities, and there's a certain probability for electrons to collide in the lattice as they're moving through. So that's what contributes to um, resistance from a material st science standpoint. But we uh, did an example of um, uh, calculating resistance and, and so forth, uh, we, uh, or uh, calculating um, uh, drift velocities and current and things like that. So. Um, 
we, cal we got to calculating electrical resistance last time. We did one example, and I would like to just revisit that example real quick, and then go to um, yeah, go to the you know, second and third examples. Okay, so um, I'm going to open up my OneNote window here, and we'll start fresh here. So. Uh, Calculating electrical resistance is one of the more challenging types of problems that you're going to have in this class because it, it often involves multiple integrations. It also involves some certain concepts. Okay, and that's why I like to uh, revisit the first problem and go over the second problem and the third example problem you're going to have as homework, but I'm going to give you a hint on that. Okay, so we want to derive the electrical, re electrical resistance of a wire or conductor of given or a given geometry, any arbitrary geometry. So we're going to do a few examples of that. Okay. So the resistance, as you know, is defined as voltage divided by current. Um, v equals IR is what you learned in your other classes, but here in electromagnetics, we are going to say that the voltage. We have a definition for the voltage. It's the integral of E dot dl, and we know that I is the integral of J dot ds. So the, the one on the numerator is a line integral, and the one on the denominator is a surface uh, integral. All right. So we are redefining resistance in terms of our electromagnetic formulas instead of the basic V over I. All right. um, uh, so the one thing here is that the J has been converted over to sigma E because J and, and E are related by this uh, parameter called uh, conductivity. Conductivity is equal to rho, um, rho v times the mobility. These are all material parameters. Okay, so the voltage can be found by performing a line integral in the direction of current flow, and then the current can be found by taking the surface integral in density in the cross section. So here's a strategy to finding resistance. If you remember from when you're finding in your circuits classes, you're looking at um, Remember when you were doing Thevenin and equivalent circuits, you had to apply a test voltage and then calculate what the test current is going to be. And the ratio of the two is the resistance of the material. So we're going to follow a similar approach in this class, uh, except we're now going to apply our electromagnetics formulas to find V and I. So um, we did this example last time. We'll go over it really quickly. Um, the resistance of a wire of constant uh, cross section. Okay. So you have this uh, basic wire here, and our strategy, as we found last time, is we apply a test voltage V0, um, and we, uh, um, uh, we apply a test voltage V0, and we uh, determine what the test current is. Okay, so um, let me just go through really quickly what I mean in that. Um, I'll just draw it again here. So can have, I would like for you to recognize that there's a very uh, intuitive process when you're doing these types of problems. You either have to apply a test voltage V0, or if that doesn't work, you can apply a test current I0. One of the two approaches will generally work. Okay, so in this case, we are going to apply a test voltage V0. So imagine that we have current here like this. Okay. All right, we're calling this the, um, you know, we can call this the x-axis because that's what's shown in the problem. Um, but remember, this x-axis is like a z-axis, as we saw previously. Um, this is a cylindrical type coordinate system, except that we're replacing the z-axis with x. All right, r is in this direction, phi is in this uh, other direction here. Okay. Now, um, so when we apply a test voltage V0, here like this, we are going to get a test current. So that's what we're going to uh, basically find out. What is that test current? All right, so the first step here is to find the electric field using V0 equals negative integral of E dot dl. A key observation here is that the electric field is constant in X. Okay, for every type of resistance problem, you have to recognize that there's some kind of symmetry that you have to take advantage of. All right. Um, so in this problem, uh, you recognize that the electric field is constant um, in X because the cross-section is not changing. 
the cross section is not changing, you imagine that the voltage is just going to go down linearly across the resistor. And so your electric fields are going to be constant. The voltage is going down at a specific rate. The electric field is a, a constant. So uh, knowing that, the first step is find the electric field based on the test voltage that we apply. So we know this relationship V equals the integral of E dot, e dot DL. We're saying V0 is going to be the integral of E dot DL. So negative E dot DL here. Okay. Now we are going from X. So this is going to be from uh, X equals 0 to X equals L, the length of the resistor, the length of the wire. All right. So the E... The electric field, we are going to assume that it's is going to be EX times X hat, meaning it's a constant. Okay, that's the intuition that we had to get uh, had to know for this problem in order to solve it easily. Alright, um, so here we go. Uh, we can if we know that this is E uh, this is a constant EX in the X hat direction, we can write down our DL. Our DL is DX times X hat. Okay, that's our differential length element. Okay, hopefully you guys remember how to work with those. Um, so this is going to become our, our limits of integration. Let's put that down here. We are integrating from um, x equals 0 to x equals L. Okay, one-dimensional integration. It's a line integration, so there's only one variable that we integrate. So this is going to be x equals 0 to L. Uh, e dot DL, you take the dot product of these two things, EX times DX. All right, and you get EX um, times X going from uh, L to zero, so you get EX times L. And so your voltage, your V0 is equal to negative EX times L. So whatever voltage you apply, if you apply a voltage like this, the electric field is going to go in this direction. All right, so the second step you do, so we applied as a function of V. We found the electric field as a function of V. The second step, okay, if we go back to here, second step is to find J is just equal to sigma E, and that's, that's easy. So J equals sigma e, so this is negative sigma e x times l. All right, and um, you can also put this in terms of v0, right? So, um, so from here we found that uh, e, at e sub x is equal to um, negative V0 over L. Okay, so let me uh, let me just redo this here because I want to be very explicit about this. So J is equal to sigma E. Okay, we know that um, that electric field is only in the X direction. Okay, so the electric field is equal to EX times X hat. Okay, so we know that J is also going to be just in the uh, X direction. All right, so we can say JX equals um, sigma times EX. Or if we want to write it in the full form, it's up to you, whatever makes more sense to you. Um, you can, one thing you can do here is you can say the electric field is equal to um, v0 over L in the x hat direction, okay? So here was the scalar form of it. I just wrote that the electric field is, the electric field in the x direction is equal to this, and here I wrote it out in the vector form. The electric field is equal to v, v0 over L times x hat, all right? So here I can say that the j is equal to sigma e, so this j is equal to sigma times V0 over L with a negative sign, and um, this is pointing in the x hat direction.
I just want to do it in the scalar form, then I can just do sigma uh, b0 over l, and I don't indicate a direction here. I just I assumed I have a jx here, so that means it's moving in the x hat direction. Okay, and I have to have, have to have my negative sign here. All right, so this is how we found the current. So now we have the current, uh, the current density as a function of the voltage. Now we find the total current. I is equal to the integral of j dot ds. All right, so really quickly, we have our formula for j, negative sigma v0 over l in the x hat direction. And we look at a cross section here. And that cross section is a circle. So that's the cross section through which the charges are moving. And so ds is a vector that points orthogonal to that differential surface. So the ds is equal to x hat. You can see that this normal vector is pointing in the x hat direction and the magnitude is, of it is going to be the differential area of that circle. And so this is going to be r times d phi dr. So r dr d phi. Okay, that's the uh, differential area of the circle. All right, so the double integral here, so our, um, our limits of integration for this circle that we're going to integrate, R is going from, um, you know, our question was asking that this, uh, this has a, a cross-sectional area A, but let's say that it has a radius equal to B. So radius is going from 0 to B. And our phi is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Right? That's how we will integrate this entire circle here. So let's just say that this is radius b. Okay, so we're going to take the integral from phi equals 0 to 2 pi and the integral from r equals 0 to b. Our j dot ds, we have um, a j is, is this, it's in the x hat direction, ds is in the x hat direction. So we just multiply these two together. And so we get negative um, sigma v0 over l um, r d phi dr. Okay. So we have just this integral to solve to find the total current. We're going to separate out the variables. I'm going to make a little bit more space here. Phi is equal to 0, 2 pi of d phi. So we have this portion here. We have a bunch of constants, negative phi v0 over L. These are all constants, not a function of R. And then uh, here we have the uh, um, R is going from 0 to B. Of R uh, dr. All right. So hopefully everyone's uh, hopefully everyone's with me here. Okay. This becomes one half. R squared, 1 half B squared, let's just substitute that in. So the solution to this integral um, is 1 half R squared, um, and then you take it from 0 to B. This part becomes 2 pi, and then this part is just comes down sigma V0 over L. And uh, the halves cancel here, and you're left with... Um, pi b squared sigma v0 over l. Okay, so you, now we've solved for the current. Notice the current has a negative sign. It's going in, uh, in the negative direction. All right, now for step four is now that you have a relationship between current and voltage, you can just find the ratio of the two. So the ratio, that's the strategy here, is that you, you find the current in terms of the voltage, the test voltage. Or in, in another problem, you may apply a test current and find it 
find the resulting voltage in response to that test current. Oh, good. We have a question here. Um, Hamza is asking, how is sigma E equal to sigma V0? That was before. Um, all good now. Okay. All right. Good. So the resistance is equal to V0, the test voltage that we had, V over I. Okay. So this is going to be V0 divided by the current that we found. And the current is pi V squared sigma V0 um, over L. So we're going to put this here. Okay. Um, now, just a little bit note about, about the negative sign here. Okay. The negative sign in this case, it, it's indicating that the current is going in the negative direction. Okay. But that doesn't mean you have a negative resistance. The resistance is defined as a ratio of voltage over current. So we're just eliminating this minus sign. We're looking at the absolute value of the current. Okay. All right. So there's, there's just a subtle, a subtle note there. Okay. Um, so uh, we just put in our current formula here, pi b squared sigma v0 divided by L. And uh, so the two v0s cancel. And you're left with L over pi b squared times sigma. All right. And this pi b squared is just the cross-sectional area. So if you want to generalize it, if when you generalize this formula to if, if it's not a circle, if it's like a square or something, it turns out that um, that, that uh, it's it just uh, the resistance is equal to L over sigma A. Okay, we did this example. The example that we did happens to be a circular wire, but um, if it's other other cross sections, it turns out that um, the resistance is still equal to L divided by sigma A. Okay, um, so the reason I showed you that, that problem again is because I want you to see that the, the, the process was to apply a test voltage, V0, and to find the resulting test current that we did in step 3, and then the resistance is the ratio of the two. Right? So that's what, in the first step, we found the electric field as a function of the test uh, voltage. Then we found the current density. Then we found the current as a function of v0. Okay, we found e as a function of v0, j as a function of v0, and then we found i as a function of v0. Okay, and that's what allowed us to calculate the resistance because we have a formula relating i to v0. Now, in other cases, um, I'll let me just ask you, um, I'm just ask you a quick polling question to see if everyone's everyone's here. We'll just do the second one here. Oh, okay. So you know that the electric field is the same everywhere. Is the current density the same everywhere? So let's just a true false question. So the question is, is the current density the same everywhere? All right, just delete that other question to make sure that there's no confusion here. All right, give me one second here. I need to make a quick adjustment. All right, so let's see what we got. Um, all right, 
and I should all be able to see this now. Um, all right, so, oh, even spread. Okay, all right, so there's something that we definitely need to understand here. <coughs> All right, so um, we, we said that one of the key observations was that the electric field is constant in the x direction. Wherever you are in this wire, actually, it turns out that uh, E is constant in x. It's also constant in R. The electric field is actually the same everywhere. Mm. So the question was, is the current density the same everywhere? And the correct answer <coughs> is true. So I see eight of you had put true, nine of you had put false. Um, so the reason why the current density is the same everywhere is because the current density, J, J is equal to sigma E. All right, so if E is the same everywhere, then J is also the same everywhere. Okay. Um, does anyone want uh, w would like to just uh, um, throw in the chat like um, if there's a point about this that you're confused about that we can go over as a class? Okay. All right. Then we'll continue. Um, all right. So the second example is a resistance with a non-constant cross section. So in this case, the cross section was the same everywhere. And because of that, um, it turns out that the, um, because the cross section was the same everywhere, the electric field was the same everywhere. When you have a resistant, when you have a resistor with a non-constant cross section, you have to use a slightly different strategy, but very similar. Um, so this is a this is a problem where you're finding the leakage resistance between the inner and outer conductors of a coax cable. Now many of you have seen a coax cable. If you've looked at the inside of it, there's actually a small wire on the inside, and then there's a larger wire on the outside. So there are two concentric uh, cylinders actually. The one on the outside is a conductor. It's it's a shell of wire. It's kind of like usually wrapped with something that looks like aluminum foil on the outside, and then there's a wire on the inside. So um, what they're trying to ask in this problem is they're asking like, can you actually, um, normally you wouldn't want any conduction between the inner and outer conductor because, you know, normally this is at a voltage and the outer one is at ground. That's how coax cables normally work. You don't want any, um, you don't want your, your, uh, your voltage and your ground to be shorted together. Um, but uh, you know, most of the times these uh, coax cables are filled with a dielectric material, not a conductive material. But, um, you know, no material is perfect and there can be some conduction of current from the inside wire to the outside wire. So they're basically asking what is this uh, resistance, the leakage resistance between the inner and outer conductors of the wire um, given that the material has a conductivity sigma. Inner conductor has a radius A, outer conductor has a radius B. All right, so this is a, uh, this is a more challenging question. And you see that uh, the first thing you have to notice when you look at this problem is, is when you think about the direction of current flow. I see Rima has a question. Rima, go ahead. Uh, if, you, if you don't have a question, also let me know. That's fine. Okay, I, um, I'm not able to, I'm not receiving the messages. So I will just continue then. Um, okay, so the current is going from the, the middle conductor to the outer conductor. So our strategy to find the resistance is we are going to apply a test current I0. In the last problem, we applied a test voltage I0. Um, this time, we're going to apply a test current um, I0. The reason why is because this approach tends to work better when you have resistors with non-constant cross-section. 
Okay, so I, I would like everyone to think about this problem for a second and think about how the current is going to flow from the inside to the outside. Okay, and think about the current density J. So the question I'm going to ask you, and this is, you know, it's a tricky question, but I'd like for you to, you know, pick the right answer here. See if you can. Um, I'm going to copy this to the next slide so you can see it. So the um, polling question that I'm going to have here is, uh, you know, pick one of the four. So I'll just put this out here, A, B, C, D. The current density is a function of R. It's the first option. The second option is that the current density is a function of phi. Third one is the current density is a function of Z. Um, I'm sorry, not Z. It should be the X. X, you know, this direction is um, X here. And the last one is the current density is constant. So you really have to think about the geometry of the problem in this case. Think about the current flowing from the inner conductor to the outer conductor and think about what the density is going to look like. Is the density going to change as a function of any one of these variables, r, phi, or x? I'll give you a minute to think about that. While you're doing that, I'm just going to get this. Um, I'm going to get our VLAT thing started. Okay. All right, so, oh, this is good. All right, so 70% of you had A, 14 for A, um, one for B, two for C, and two for D. This is great. Um, so um, can someone who, who put that answer A, can, can anyone tell me, can just briefly explain why it's a function of R? And again, don't don't be shy. It's uh, okay. I see a few people are typing. That's good. Why does J change as a function of R? Okay, two different R's, okay. Um, uh, yes, uh, 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 Noah is asking two different R's. Yeah, if you have two different distances, uh, why would the density change? Uh, Hamza says <coughs> J is equal to sigma E, <coughs> and E depends on B and A. That is true. Uh, current is leaking in the out outward um, direction. John, R is a change in volume of space available, which means a variable density. Yes, yes. This is very close to what we're looking for, John. So, yes, uh, thank you for that. So, think about this, is that you, I'm going to draw in here, here. <clears throat> the current is moving from inside outwards, okay? So, the current is going in this direction, it's going in this direction. And so, if I redraw that here, So I'm going to draw an intermediate cylinder in here. So imagine that the current is going outside this cylinder like this. It's traveling outwards here like this. Okay, this is the outer shell. 
and this one is the inner shell. The current is going through a surface, and that surface looks like the outside of a cylinder. Okay, when you're at a small r, all the current is flowing through a small cylinder like this. When you're at a large r, the diameter, the radius of the circle, this r becomes larger. So remember how we said i is um, i is the integral of j dot ds. Okay, and and um, you know we also can think about kind of like a rule of thumb if the current density happens to be uh, the same everywhere on the surface, then it's equal to j times a. All right. So the reason I'm telling you this is because you can see that as this cylinder becomes larger, there's m the area of that cylinder becomes larger. And if the area of that cylinder becomes larger, then the current density actually goes down. Let me say that again. Think about Kirchhoff's current law. It's like when this current is going from the inside to the outside, um, the, current, the current has to be the same uh, everywhere. The total current must remain the same. But the current density, the density of current is getting smaller because the surface of the cylinder is getting larger. So this A is going up, and so therefore the J is going down because you have to have a constant current um, regardless of what point you're at. Okay, so that is the key intuition in uh, solving this problem. Okay, so... Uh, the i is going to be the same, but the current density changes uh, as you go further and further out, as the radius of uh, your cylinder becomes larger. So th um, as a result of that, you use this approach uh, applying a test current i0. A key observation here is that j is a function of r. All right, so I hope this becomes more clear when we look at this here. So our first step in solving this problem is to find j using i0 equals the integral of j dot ds. Okay, compare this to the previous problem. Here we found e, we applied a test voltage v0 and we found e as a function of v0. Here we're going in the opposite direction. We have a test current i0 and we're finding j in terms of i0. And then we find e in terms of j and then we find V in terms of E, and then we find uh, this allows us to find V in terms of the test current that we applied. All right, so this is what you did here. Um, the first step is um, J is equal to I over A. Okay, um, and you, this is equal to uh, R hat I over 2 pi RL. And if anyone has a question of where that came from, uh, we can look, uh, take a closer look at that. Uh, just one second here. Okay, so I'm just going to draw out this problem real quick. So yeah, I'm going to make it easy on myself. I'm just going to copy and paste this over. Okay, so our first step here is we are applying a test current. Okay, so we're applying a test current, and that current is going to go in this direction, I0. Okay, so the first step is to find j in terms of i0. Okay, and j is going to vary as a function of r. All right, so we can use the formula um, i0 is equal to the integral of j dot ds. Okay. Now, um, you look at, look at a cylinder, okay? The current is flowing through one of these cylinders. We look at this blue dotted line here, like so, and think about the outer area of that cylinder. We are integrating, the surface we are integrating is 
the outer portion of the cylinder, not the two caps at the two ends, just the sides. Okay, so if I can sort of highlight that here, this is the surface we are integrating. All right, so um, our uh, J, we have a relationship for, <coughs> we're going to say that J is equal to JR, and this is going to be in the R hat direction. All right, this is the key intuition that we had to know, is that the J is going to be a function of R, but it's going to be symmetric and the J is going to be same depending on whatever angle you're at. Whatever your phi is, it's, it's going to be symmetric in the uh, axial direction, but it's going to reduce. It's going to go uh, become less and less as you go from the inner conductor to the outer conductor. So it's a function of R. All right. Um, And so the current is in uh, the, the uh, DS. Uh, this is in the R hat direction also. And the magnitude, you know, we're integrating the outside area. Okay, so we are going to be um, integrating uh, the phi and uh, this direction x. So it's going to be dx. and uh, r times d phi. Okay. So this, they're both in the r hat direction. Let's figure out our limits of integration. If we're integrating this, the outer portion of the cylinder, our limits of integration is going to be phi is equal to 0 to 2 pi. And we're going to be at constant r, but our x is going to vary. From zero to L. Okay, so this is how we set up this uh, set up the integral here. Okay, so our phi equals zero to two pi. X equals zero to L. And the, the dot product of the two here is J R D X R D phi. Okay, and uh, this basically comes out to, in just the interest of saving time, is jr times 2 pi r l. Okay, so the j is, is a function of, um, the, the current is a, a function of uh, jr times 2 pi r l, and if we solve for, um, solve for jr, is equal to I zero over two pi R L. Okay, so this is telling us that the current density, the current density is I zero divided by two pi R L. So in other words, it is um, as R increases, the current density goes down. Okay, so it actually looks kind of like this. As a function of r, the jr goes down um, as a 1 over x function. All right, that's the key intuition of this problem that needs to be understood. Uh, I see we have some questions here. Current going from this. Okay. All those were from the previous question I asked. Okay. So the next step is to find. Um, J, oh, J and E in terms of I, yes, but we're just, we already found J, so we're just going to find E in terms of J. So we have the relationship uh, J equals sigma E, so our E is going to be J over sigma, so I zero over two sigma pi R L. That is our relationship for E. And then the third step is we have to find uh, the voltage 
as a function of e. All right, so we're going to do this integral. d is equal to the integral of e dot dl. Now, um, when we remember when we do these integrals, uh, it's j dot ds. So in, in the case of the current integral, we are integrating over this surface here. Okay, so the surface through which the current flows. That's how what we do in the surface integral. But when we do the line integral, we are integrating in a single dimension in the direction that the current is going. So, um, if I find v equals the negative integral of e dot dl. Okay, we are integrating from the inner conductor to the outer conductor. So our electric field is, is here. Um, now we can add our vectors here. What is the direction of E? It's in the r hat direction. The electric field is IO over 2 pi RL. It's in the r hat direction. And our um, DL, we are integrating from the inner conductor to the outer conductor, going from low radius to large radius. So this is dr times r hat. Okay. Our limits of integration as we're going from the inner conductor to the outer conductor, r is going from a to b. Just to remind everyone, a is the radius of the inner conductor, b is the radius of the outer conductor. So when we set up this integral, we get r is going from a to b. e dot dl, you notice these are both in the r hat direction. So it's i0 over 2 pi sigma rl times um, dr. All right, you'll notice that this integral is going to look a little bit different than the ones from before, because when we take the constants out, you're going to have this i0 over 2 pi sigma out here, and you're going to have the integral from r equals a to b of dr over r. All right, so can someone put in the, in the chat window, what is the integral of dr over r? So the integral of 1 over x. Yes, that's right. It's a natural log. So we get i0, uh, 2 pi sigma ln of r from a to b. All right, so this is ln of b minus ln of a. And if you remember your log formulas, this becomes ln of b over a. So i0 over 2 pi sigma ln of b over a. All right, that is our, um, that is our voltage here. Okay, um, let's see, let me make sure I have that correct. High potential, the low potential. Ah, when you do your voltages, just keep in mind here that um, the, the limits of integration should actually go from, uh, from the low voltage to the high voltage if you're using this negative formula. If it goes from the low uh, from the high voltage to the low voltage, um, then you don't need the negative sign. So let's revisit this uh, in your notes just so you're all aware of it. Remind you of it. You're trying to find the electrostatic potential difference uh, between two points. Uh, V2 minus V1 is uh, the integral of P1 to P2 of E dot DL. Okay, so uh, you're going in this case from the lower voltage to the higher voltage. 
and then you you negate that okay so one of the things that I just have to fix here is we want to go from the lower voltage to the higher voltage negative integral of e dot dl and your limits of integration should go from the lower voltage to the higher voltage all right so let me just change that oops B to A, change this from B to A. All right, so this is going to be A over B. Now this negative sign, we can take this negative sign and um, uh, put that in here, and this becomes ln of A minus ln of B. Hold on, fix this. Ln of A minus Ln of B. Okay, and you can take this negative sign out by just doing A. I0, 2 pi, sigma, Ln of B over A. Okay, when you apply the negative sign to the Ln terms, the, the two fractions flip because it becomes then it, uh, you know, then it becomes ln of b minus ln of a. Uh, you forgot to take the l out of the integral. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Let's add that in there. All right, the last step, we found the voltage in terms of the current, and now we just take the ratio of the two. So I'm going to show you you know, you can either do R is equal to um, V over I0, okay, and you can put V at the top and then put your I0 formula at the bottom. So that's what we're going to do, which is probably the easiest way to do it. So V, or, sorry, um, our V is equal to I0 over 2 pi sigma L, ln of B over A, over I0. So your I0 is cancel, and so you get 1 over 2 pi sigma L, ln of B over A, as, as your resistance. Okay, so uh, you know, lots a uh, lot of calculations involved in that problem, but I hope you see the major steps. That's similar to the answer that you have in the um, in here. Now this this is giving you um, the conductance, so keep that in mind. I'm, I I calculated the resistance, and this example here is is showing you the conductance. All right, we'll do one more example here, then we'll get into power. Now this example, I'm actually not going to do this uh, for you. I'm not going to solve this problem for you. I'm actually just going to give you a hint because this is one of your homework problems. Um, actually, not one of the homework problems for this Thursday. It's one of the homework problems for the following Thursday. So I just want you to think about think about this um, because thinking about how current flows through materials is a very important intuition that you want to gain as an engineer. So suppose we have a quarter of a flat washer, an annulus with an inner radius A and outer radius B, and a thickness H. What is the resistance here? Okay, so um, our strategy actually in this problem is going to apply a test of voltage V0. Okay, but you know the two questions you have to ask yourself in these types of resistance problems is do you want to apply a test voltage or do you want to apply a test current? The second thing you have to think about is what is your key observation? You have to have some intuition about this geometry in order to make this problem, in order to decide whether to uh, apply a test voltage or a test current. So I want you to think about this 
and I'm going to do the same thing that I did before. I'm going to copy this over to the next slide and I'm going to give a polling question here. Oops. All right, so uh, four possible answers, A, B, C, D. So pick the correct answer here. We are applying a voltage to a quarter washer geometry and uh, choose whether the electric field is gonna vary with R, phi, or Z. So let me define what the coordinates are, okay? Phi is going around in this direction Z is this direction here, then R, if you imagine that you're at the center of a circle here, this is your coordinate system. So this is R is equal to A, R is equal to B. This is the origin. So this is a cylindrical coordinate system. So just to be explicit, I'll say that this is the R is this direction here. The electric field varies with R, phi, or Z. Haha, let's see, this is going to be an interesting one. Okay, I'll give, um, I'll give everyone a few, uh, a little bit more time to respond. There are six of you that haven't responded yet. So I do want to remind everyone that, that, uh, you know, your responses to these questions are, um, you know, part of your participation score. So it is to your advantage to um, provide a response because it will be counted as part of your participation grade. Okay, it looks like we have 16 out of 20 folks responding. Uh, 12 people put B and then uh, 4 people uh, four people put A. All right, so let's look at correct answers actually A, not B. Oops. The electric field varies with R, not as phi. So let's think about why that's the case, okay? So th this is how you have to look at some of these problems. You have to think about you're applying a voltage to it, um, you're going to get an electric field, and you think about where the, the electric field is, where the currents are going. So you're going to end up with uh, current vectors that look like this. I see Sang and Hamza are both typing. I have a question. Okay, let me check the questions. So Hamza is saying R is fixed and Z is fixed. Phi is changing, so so it varies as if um, yeah, that's that's a rationale that you had for phi. But here's the thing: um, imagine that you have these current vectors. Okay, so you kind of have to think about how electric fields go here. So you apply a voltage here. The current is going to flow this way, right? We all agree that the current is going to flow. I'm going to make this a different color here. Current is going to flow this way. Okay. That's our current I. But what's interesting here in this problem is that you have to think about how the, um, how the current density may behave and how the electric field may behave. So, Current likes to always go the path of least resistance, right? If if one of the electrons, let's say one of the charges, one of the charges here can go, it can go 
like this can take the long path or electrons can also take the short path. If any, if any of you remember when you're running in track, like if any of you did track and field in high school, you know how people on the inner lanes, they have to travel less distance, right? So when you go around a curve, they have less distance to travel. When you're going around a curve like this, there's less distance on the inner part of the curve than the outer part. As a result, you know, electrons like to flow, follow the path of least resistance, so you're actually going to get, 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 kind of get more current density on the inside here than you are on the outside. There's going to be less current density on the outside. It doesn't mean that current is not going to flow on the outside. It will, but less current density on the outside, more current density on the inside. Okay, so that's the key intuition of this problem, is that the current density and the electric field, remember that J is equal to sigma E, right? There's going to be more current density on the inside, and therefore there's going to be more electric field. The electric field is going to be larger on the inside, okay? If that answer, if, if thinking about it that way doesn't make sense to you, I want to put it out another way. I'm going to put, describe it another way. So let me just erase this. And maybe this, this way might make more sense. Sometimes, you know, you have to think about which, which explanation makes the most sense to you. So this is going to be V0. And let's say this is going to, I'm sorry, let's say this is going to be V0, because we have a plus sign there. And the voltage here is going to be 0. All right. So as you go from here to here, your voltage is going to go from some voltage V0, let's say 5 volts, and it's going to go down as you travel along the length of the resistor. And it's going to be 0 by the time you get to this end. All right. This is just a resistor, right? So along this path here, this long path, the, um, there's going to be a gradual decrease of V0 going to 0 volts here. On the inner path, there's going to be a decrease in V0 going to 0 like this. Okay. The rate, you know, this is a shorter line on the inside, so the rate at which V, the voltage changes is going to be more drastic. The rate at which voltage changes is going to be higher on the inside track than the outside track. Okay, and remember this relationship, um, E is equal to the negative gradient of the, the voltage. So the electric field depends on how rapidly the voltage is changing. It's kind of like the derivative of, of the voltage. So because there's less distance to travel here, the, the, elect the voltage is changing more rapidly. And because the, it's changing more rapidly, the, um, the gradient of V is larger, and therefore you have a larger electric field. OK, uh, Song has a question. Um, is it R equals B minus A? Um, could you explain? I didn't quite get that, Song. So are you talking about the limits of integration in this problem? You are, okay. Okay. So um, I, I'm glad you brought that up because actually the, the limits of integration and how to solve this problem step by step is something I'm not going to do in the lecture today because this is one of your homework questions in next week's homework. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you a hint on how to think about this. The hint I'm going to give you is that the uh, you're going to apply a test voltage V0 and the key observation is that the electric field varies with R, and therefore the current density also varies as a function of R. Okay, if you know that, uh, then you apply these steps, you should be able to solve uh, the problem here. Okay, but just in the interest of time, I'm not doing it, and also because I want you to do it as a homework problem. Okay, so let's move on then. Um, there's more examples of calculating resistance. Uh, find the resistance of 100 meters of copper wire with a diameter of 1 millimeter. Calculate the resistance of a copper strip 200 microns across 1 centimeter long. And these are very straightforward problems to do. So they're going to be easy points on your test. This R is just equal to L divided by sigma A. 
right? So just remember to use the correct units. So this is going to be 100, 100 meters on top. And um, sigma, you're going to have to look up sigma. It's going to be given to you on a chart. Remember to use the MKS units here. And the area, um, also remember to use the MKS units. So this is going to be pi times 0 0.001 squared. Right. So if you know the conductivity of copper, which we can look up somewhere, then you'll be able to get the resistance of, of the copper wire. Similarly, um, you know, this is very similar uh, with, uh, you're going to use the same formula, R equals L divided by sigma A, except this time you have a rectangular cross-section instead, um, uh, instead of a circular cross-section. So it's, it just becomes sigma times the width times t. So you think about your strip of copper like this. The length of the copper strip is like this. This is the width and this dimension is the thickness. That will give you the resistance of a copper strip. Now the sheet resistance is ohms per square. So when we talk about you know, copper strips like this. This is the top view that we're looking at. Okay, this has a certain thickness T. I'm not showing the thickness T in this in this top diagram. Uh, the sheet resistance is uh, um, is given in ohms per square. So the way you think about sheet resistance is um, uh, um, it's uh, 1 over sigma t. Okay, where t is the thickness. This is the sheet uh, sheet resistance. Okay, and the reason why that becomes important is because uh, when you're doing uh, layouts, like printed circuit board layouts, um, the designer can control the width and the length of a copper strip, but they cannot control the thickness. The thickness is controlled by the process that's used to make the printed circuit board. Okay, so the only uh, the things that, that the designer has control over, R is equal to L divided by sigma, sigma times WT, they only have control over this and this. So this 1 over sigma T is something that is given, um, that is, is, uh, given to the designer as part of the process. Okay, and the reason why sheet resistance is interesting is because uh, you can visually think about if you have a strip like this, how many squares can you break that strip up into? And uh, you take the sheet resistance and, and that'll be ohms per square. You count up how many squares you have, one, two, three, four, five, six. So uh, the resistance here is going to be um, the sheet resistance times six. So interestingly, if you happen to have another trace, which is half the thickness, but half the um, half the length. Sorry, let me redraw this. If you have another um, resistor that ah, uh, hold on, let me let me again redraw this. Let's say you have a resistor that is um, half the thickness of it. Both of these resistors are actually going to have the same resistance. Okay, that's the reason why sheet resistance is a useful concept when you're doing uh, printed circuit boards. In this case, you have a nice wide trace. So with the wide trace, uh, that conducts current easier. You can see you can have you can accommodate a longer trace. This has the same uh, uh, similar resistance, the same resistance as this case, where you have uh, a smaller width and a smaller length. So you can bo divide both of these up into squares, and they'll have the same the number of squares determines how much resistance you have in the material. Okay, all right. So let's uh, move on and talk about uh, Joule's law. 
Uh, so we talk about electrical power. Uh, electrical power is uh, basically the, the, the idea that when you have, um, when you're applying a force and you're moving and, and you're using that force to move charges through a distance, you are dissipating power. It takes energy to do that. So when current is flowing through a resistor, you are actually dissipating uh, uh, power. You're putting work, you're doing work on the system. Okay, so again, we thought about work as a force through a distance. We thought about that weight lifter, like lifting a barbell, that weight is being applied through a distance. Electrical power is a similar concept where you have an electric field applying an electric force on a charged particle. So you imagine that there's, um, you have a conductor here and you, you have an electric field, you've applied a voltage and there's a resulting electric field and the charges are moving in certain directions. So that electric field is doing work on these charges and the charges are moving. The, there's a certain amount of force. Force is equal to E times Q. Remember that? Oops. Force equals E times Q. Right, so you're applying a force and these things are moving at a certain velocity. So you are uh, dissipating power continuously in that volume. So uh, this is where the derivation comes from. This is the differential form of it. Uh, work is equal to force times dx, right? Force through a distance. And then power is equal to the rate of work versus time. So it's d work dt. The amount of work you're doing in a given amount of time. So that's where this is coming from. P is equal to dw dt. And from here, you can kind of go through and uh, figure out the mechanics of how electric current is flowing. So uh, work is equal to force through a distance. So the power is force through a distance divided by dt. So force and multiplied by dx dt. And dx dt is the velocity of the charges. So we already know how to calculate the velocity of the charge. Um, by the way, we're splitting it up into the velocity of electrons and the velocity of holes. So the U stands for the velocity of electrons multiplied by the uh, velocity of holes. Um, let me just fix one typo here. This says this says mu here, and this this should actually be mu, not u. All right, remember everyone that u stands for velocity. Mu stands for the mobility of the material. All right, so this is the velocity of the electrons is equal to the electric field times the mobility, and and then you have here the charge density, electric field times uh, the mobility. All right. Um, so this becomes the electric field times Je plus Jh. This is the current density here. Um, so electric field times the current density times the mu is equal to the current density, and you get E times J here. And so this is your differential form of the, of the power, the electric power. All right, so the integral form. You take, you take this differential form of power, E times J. That's the key conclusion here. The power is equal to the electric field times the current density in a differential volume. So you draw a little differential volume like this, and if you want to find the total power dissipated in this volume, then uh, you just do this integral here. So you take this and you integrate this differential form over uh, the volume in which you want to find the power dissipation. So this formula is stating as follows. The power dissipated in the volume V is equal to the electric field dot product with the current density and you integrate that over the volume. Okay, and the second form of it here is that the fact that the, the current density J is equal to sigma E and that's how you get the second form here. So I'll just jot that down, J equals sigma E and so you can put the whole thing in terms of E. All right. 
So the stronger the electric field, the more uh, power dissipation you're going to have in a given volume. Wherever you have strong electric fields, you have more power dissipation. And I actually want to show you an example of that. Um, but before we get to that, uh, I just want to mention that how does Joule's law simplify to the equation that you've seen in your circuits class? In circuits class, you, you remember that P equal, equal to IV, also equal to I squared R, V squared over R. So these are all just um, the basic forms of the power equation for uh, Joule's law in a wire, in a conductive wire. So you can very easily get to those um, equations by applying this differential form of Joule's law, the integral form of it, and you do that integral uh, over a wire like this. So um, a triple integral, what, what you're doing is you're splitting it up into um, splitting it up into the surface and then um, over the length. So you're integrating twice here and you're integrating once here. So this is the um, this is the current and this is the total current, and this is the voltage. Okay, so as part of the integral, when you split up the integral in the, into the two parts, you can quickly see that uh, um, you know the the integral of here. Let me just clarify this. Remember. The sigma ex, this is the current density. The integral, the uh, uh, surface integral of j dot ds, that's just the current. The line integral of the electric field is the voltage. So this is, this is how you basically come to this uh, uh, equation for the power dissipated in a conductive, uh, conductive wire. Okay. Um, so, you know, I went over that very uh, relatively quickly, but I, I encourage you to go through this uh, step by step and see if you can figure out how to do that integral and prove Joule's law to yourself. A uh, quick, um, quick example that I want to show here, I don't even want to spend much time out in this class because this is extremely uh, simple, I would say. It's, uh, this is a, um, a plug and chug. Hold on. There we go. I'm not able to see my mouse. Just a minute. There we go. All right. So uh, power dissipation in a wire. Actually, you've done this sort of problem in your circuits class. Uh, first find the resistance and then find the power. 50 meter long copper wire with the radius 2 centimeters. You're given the conductivity. Calculate the resistance of the wire. Calculate, calculate the power dissipated in the wire when the applied voltage is 1.5 millivolt. So R is equal to L divided by sigma A. So we did an example of that uh, earlier. Uh, you find the resistance of the wire. And the P is just equal to V squared over R, 3.3 um, milliwatts. Okay, so that in a nutshell is um, all about power dissipation. Now, in the last 15 minutes of the class, I actually want to go through a quick example in COPSL where you can do the, uh, the, the current uh, flow in a wire. Um, and then next time, next time in class, we'll get to dielectrics. So I'm just going to go to my VLAB here. Um, just a moment here. Okay. All right, so everyone can see my VLAB monitor here. Great. Um, I'm going to go to console and I'm just going to do a quick example of this here. So what we're going to do in console right now is uh, I'm going to show you an example of a copper trace so while we're waiting for a console to load up here. We're going to do an example like this. We have a copper wire like this. All right, now as you know, like a lot of times in, in printed circuit boards, you'll have some kind of electronic component Let's say you have a component here and you have a component here. Component one, component two. 
and these components on a printed circuit board are connected by these copper traces. All right, so we're going to look at the current flow, the current density as the current travels around this corner from component one to component two. All right, and what we're going to find is that there's something interesting that happens at the corner here. So let's get right to that. Maximize this window. I think it'll take a second to adjust. So we're going to do a three-dimensional simulation this time, unlike the two-dimensional simulation we did last time. And also, this time we're going to use the electric currents module. Last time we used the electrostatics module, but now we want to find current density in addition to the electric fields. So I'm going to add this in here. So this has electric potential as a dependent variable, and that's what we're going to apply to the system. And click Done. Nope, sorry about that. All right, the first thing we're going to do here is uh, we're going to, uh, copper is going to be our material of choice. So let's add a material here. Copper, there we go. Copper is one of the most common materials used in printed circuit boards. All right. So we've added copper here. Now we're going to build a geometry. All right. Your windows will hopefully be less cramped than the one I'm looking at right now. All right. First thing we're going to do is create a block. And we're going to create one end of the copper wire. We're going to get creating three-dimensional blocks and the first one we're going to create is 100 micron wide trace. I'm oh, sorry, let's make it one millimeter. And the depth, the width of the, width of the trace, you'll see when this uh, comes out, this is going to be, let's see, 100 microns. And the height, uh, we'll make that uh, one mil, uh, 25. All right, let's make it 10. Mm, 10 microns, or, yeah, 10 microns, okay. All right, so you see we get, uh, we get our block here. I'm wondering if we can change the resolution here, I guess not. All right, that's fine. So we're gonna create a second block now And um, we're going to make this one 100 microns wide, 20 micron thickness, or 10 micron thickness, sorry. And we're going to make this one 10 microns wide. Sorry. So we have an L-shaped L-shaped geometry here. Okay, so this corner of two uh, printed circuit board, um, uh, a copper trace that's going around in a circle like this. I'm going to make these a little bit smaller so you can more easily see the see them. So just change the depth here. That's not what I wanted to do. Just changing the dimensions here. I'm going to change the length of the two uh, legs so that it's a little bit easier for you to see. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Now, um, all we're going to do in this simulation is apply uh, apply a voltage to the two ends of the wire. So that's a copper wire. We've defined it as copper. And we are going to apply an electric potential at one end. 
So I clicked electric potential as the boundary condition. I'm just going to select to zoom in here like this. I'm going to select this end. So I'm applying, I'm going to apply a 10 volt potential. So apply electric potential of 10 volts here. All right, and I'm going to double click on this and, and apply an electric potential of zero on the other end. So I'm going to click this to zoom out. I'm going to rotate this like so, and I'm going to apply a zero potential on this end of the, of the wire. Let's see, I applied an electric potential of zero. Uh, we can go to the mesh, and uh, we're going to do a physics controlled mesh. We can make it, you know, we can make it a little bit coarser or finer if we'd like. So I will make it a little bit finer than normal. We'll build the mesh. And you can see that we now have a three dimensional mesh here, like so. And we're just going to go ahead and, and uh, do a stationary solution. Uh oh. Okay, we have to add a um, add a study. Okay, add a study here like this. We forgot to add the study when we initially created um, when we initially created the model. So we, I'm, I'm doing it here. So we're going to do a stationary study. All right, and all this is going to do is solve for the solve for the voltage and current everywhere. I'm going fast through this, but I'm hoping since I'm making a recording that you'll be able to uh, figure out each one of the steps here. So all we did is we created a three-dimensional geometry, and then we applied um, applied a voltage to one side. All right. Now this is unfortunate that this is. I'm going to try to create as much space as possible here. All right, so you can see that uh, this is showing the electric, electric potential here. So we apply 10 volts to this side, and we apply 0 volts to this side. You see how the potential is going down from, from high voltage down to, uh, you know, you get down to 5 volts as you get halfway through the resistor, and then it goes down to 0 like this. So whenever electric current is flowing through a path, the voltage is decreasing. All right, we know this because... Uh, the electric field is equal to the gradient of the voltage, right? So whenever you have um, a resistor, just think about a resistor as one end of the resistor has a high voltage, the other one has a lower voltage, there's current flowing from high to low voltage, and the potential drops gradually as you go through the resistor. So this resistor happens to be in L shape like this. Now the main thing I wanted to show you here is I'm going to create, I'm going to create a second plot so that you can see the, the vectors. All right. Now I want you to see the current vectors um, as you as the current flows from here to here, and I want you to see how that you get crowding at the corner. All right. So here's what I'm going to do: is I'm going to go to the data set here, and I'm going to create I'm going to create a 2D surface. So what's called a cut plane. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a slice of the three-dimensional data. And I'm going to take it on the xy plane. So for z is equal to zero. Do you remember when I created my model, the thickness of my the thickness of my copper strips was 10 microns in thickness. So I'm going to get a cut. I'm going to cut through halfway through the thickness of the copper. So I'm going to put this plane at five microns. Okay, the thickness of the copper is 10 microns, and I want to get a cross section halfway through the copper. So when I plot this, I should be able to see a, a plot of what this uh, plane looks like. And the final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a two-dimensional plot of that particular uh, plane. So this two-dimensional plot group is the data set that it's going to be taking is the cut plane that I just created. And to that two-dimensional plot, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to plot the, I'm going to do a surface plot of the electric potential first. So you see how uh, this expression is V for electric potential. 
So I plot that. All right, so I got my electric potential plot again. And this, the other thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to add an arrow plot of the electric field. And you can see by default, it's plotting the current density. Um, actually, that's what I want. I don't want electric field. I want the current density vectors. So this is plotting the current densities in the x, y, and z directions. Only the x and y directions are relevant. And you can see here that um, you have the current density vectors here. Let's increase the density a little bit more. Okay, I can see that we're running out of time. Let's just take a few more minutes. Um, and uh, we'll make the arrows a little bit larger that you can see. Okay, now um, the last thing I want to do is I actually want to show you, instead of making a surface plot of the electrostatic potential, which is the voltage, I actually want to make a plot of the electric field intensity, or the, I'm sorry, the current density. Um, so let me do this. Let's go to the expression, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to plot, I'm going to go under electric currents, currents and charge, and I'm going to plot the, the current density. Right, we, we were just talking about current density in uh, when we were talking about that washer problem. We said the current is actually going to crowd in certain places. So this is something that engineers often will do, is they'll look at uh, where the current crowding is going to happen. And if you show this plot here, you can clearly see that uh, you get um, more current density in the middle here like this. So if I just zoom in at this corner here, you see that right at the corner, you get a very high current density. All right, and you can also see that by the arrows too. So I showed it two ways. You see how the current density vectors have a larger magnitude at this corner, but they have a smaller density, uh, smaller magnitude at the outside. This is because when the current, the, the electrons always like to find the, the, uh, the shortest path that they can. They'd rather not go around this big track. They'd rather go around this small track here. As a result of that, you get current um, current crowding here. All right. As a result of that, uh, this is an issue with um, you know, when you're doing any type of uh, circuit board manufacturing, is that when you have sharp corners like this, you end up getting uh, a lot of current crowding, and that results in a lot of power dissipation. So tying it back together with the power dissipation, we learned just now that power is equal to the current density times the electric field. So, in a, or you can think about it in terms of P equals IV. So wherever you have a high current density, you're going to get a lot more power dissipation. So you can actually get heating in these portions where you have uh, current crowding and less heating over here. So you're going to end up creating hot spots in your copper trace. And that sometimes is undesirable. Uh, when Intel and other companies are trying to make these very, very high density circuits where you have copper traces connecting transistors together and things like that, you want to avoid areas where you have uh, crowding like this. So one of the problems that you're going to be assigned is um, I'm going to ask you to figure out a geometry that will prevent that will have less crowding. Okay, and that's going to be one of your console uh, assignments. Okay, uh, good. So we're just a couple minutes over here. So I'm just going to end there. Um, so just a quick recap, we talked about uh, power dissipation. Well, if we start from the beginning, we talked about the concept of resistance and current flow. We did a bunch of examples of how to calculate resistance in different situations. Uh, we, um, uh, we talked about electrical power, Joule's law, and power dissipation and how to calculate that. And then finally, we did a console simulation of current flow uh, in a wire, in a three-dimensional uh, setting. Okay, so before we end, are there any questions before we uh, log off? No worries. Can I ex please extend the homework? Um, a little bit hesitant to do that, but if... if um, if many folks need that, I could extend it by another day. I could have you all submit it Friday um, instead of Thursday. So, okay, we, I will extend the homework deadline to Friday at um, Friday 7 p.m. So that way the grader can get started on it Friday night. Um, but 
but just keep in mind that the next homework sets will, will be um, assigned according to plan. I'm not going to delay those right now because we are getting towards the end of the semester and there's a lot more material and homeworks that I would like for you to cover. Okay, so I will extend the homework assignment till uh, Friday. Any other questions? Okay, all right, good. So we'll end there then. Um, please email me or post messages on the discussion board if you have questions on the homework, and then I will answer them there so that the answers that I provide can be of benefit to the rest of the class. Uh, good luck on the homework, and I will see you all uh, next Monday.